Arthur, what concerns you about how suppression orders are currently working or not working in Australia? I think the first observation to make is that it's virtually impossible to quarantine juries from social media and the internet. So we need to have legislation that bears in mind this fundamental truth. Otherwise, in effect, orders that are made by courts that don't take that into account, in effect, place persons at risk of breaching orders. And we need to be careful to ensure that legislation is fit for purpose. And in terms of risk of breaching orders is one thing. I mean, in practical terms, you know, is it possible to, to make sure jurors aren't exposed to reports that breach a suppression order? Because, you know, as, as we've said, in this digital age, they're there on social media, they're there in online overseas news sites. And that's the observation that former Justice Vincent made in his review of the Victorian laws in 2017. He actually observed that it was virtually impossible to quarantine juries from social media and internet. So we need to look to why are we actually granting suppression orders in cases? And it has to be necessary to prevent prejudice to the proper administration of justice. And in many cases, that can be done by giving a direction to a jury that they are to put out of their mind the fact that somebody had previously offended and to focus on whether or not the individual is guilty of the offence that they've been charged with. We also have contempt laws that prohibit the media from publishing material that has a real tendency to prejudice the conduct of a trial. So I think we need to go back to basics and say, well, why do we grant suppression orders and why do we have open justice as well? Because I think that seems to have been lost a bit in the noise in relation to all of this. Okay, I want to come back to why we grant suppression orders. But in this case, and well, in, just following from what you said, doesn't it already happen all the time that judges instruct juries to just deal with the facts before them? Absolutely. And that is a fundamental direction that is given to juries. So there is a shift in the law across the states. In New South Wales, the legislation there stipulates that the order can only be made if it's necessary to prevent prejudice to the proper administration of justice, whereas in Victoria, a judge may grant an order in order to prevent a real and substantial risk of prejudice. So it's a lower bar to get that order. And there are 200 pieces of legislation across the country that deal with orders concerning suppression in various cases. We think the time has come now for the Australian Law Reform Commission to complete the job that the Attorneys General in 2010 said they were going to do in, the, in their council meeting, which was to review and modernise Australian suppression laws and to have a standard set of laws. There's no point having different laws in different states concerning this issue. It creates confusion yeah. for the public and journalists. Is that the major issue as far as you see it, that there's no uniformity? I mean, they call Victoria, for instance, the suppression capital of the country. Is, is a, a uniform federal approach, I suppose, is what, is what needed? Is that the major problem or is it something else about how we deal with this world of digital news? I think there are two issues. There's one of uniformity and it's also coming to grips with digital era issues such as social media and the internet. I think we have to be realistic moving forward now in relation to these orders. There's no point having in effect legislation that in effect dates back centuries in terms of relying on common law principles without focusing on the technology that we have now. And as I said, my main concern is this, that court reporting strengthens the purposes of our justice system in terms of having open courts. Australian journalists are among the best trained and respected in the world. I would rather an Australian journalist be reporting on a case accurately sitting in the courtroom than somebody at the Washington Post or elsewhere who has not sat in the courtroom reporting on it. That may tend to have more inaccurate information in it. So my whole focus on this has to be why do we have open courts? And that is to ensure the integrity of our justice system to stop arbitrary decisions being made by judges. We don't tolerate closed courts for our citizens when they're in China, for instance, facing um, cases over there. And I think we need to be careful that we don't seep into a culture of suppression in this country, which in effect takes away from the public the right to know, but also I think unfairly puts the public in a position who sit on juries that they don't know the difference between convicting somebody based on the facts before them and what may have occurred in respect of another case. I think we need to give due respect to juries and to our journalists. In this case, though, are there mitigating circumstances to what you just described? In this case, the suppression order was 
put in place because the, we knew the, the court knew there was going to be a second trial. I have heard some lawyers in the last 24 hours say, uh, agreeing with you by and large about suppression orders, um, but saying in this case there was an argument. Do you have a view? Of course. Ultimately, Fran, there's an exercise of discretion that the judge has under Section 18 of the Victorian Act in relation to the matters. And the facts in this case were, we can now say, that um, the Cardinal was convicted in relation to offences relating to the 1990s in his time in Melbourne, and that the second trial was to relate to offences that were said to have occurred in the 1970s, what has been referred to in the media as a swimming pool Mm. offences. Now, the judge, I think, as I understand um, the reasoning here, took the view that one trial was to follow the other fairly closely and there may be similarity in terms of the allegations. That was open to the judge to form that view. Now, if you're asking me if I were the judge applying that provision, would I have come to that conclusion? No, because I would have looked at it from a different perspective as to what could have been done in terms of orders to ameliorate the risk, whether it be to ensuring proper directions to the jury and reminding, of course, the media in respect to their obligations not to publish prejudicial material that would have the tendency to interfere with the criminal process. But these are judgments to be made in each circumstance. These are discretionary. It's discretionary. And, And nobody can say that the judge in this case did anything other than acting in good faith based on the law and the facts that were before the judge. And it is a very difficult case and that judge came to a different view. Other judges would come to a different view. Earlier this year, the Victorian government introduced legislation that would require suppression orders only to be used when necessary and courts would have to give reasons for issuing them. Would that be a fairer system? Would that go any way towards what you're suggesting? Um, It would because I think providing reasons for suppression orders allow then there to be a testing of those orders in an appellate court to understand why the judge has made those orders. And the necessity point, I think, is quite important because that's what's been missing in the Victorian legislation. And there has been criticism in terms of the Victorian approach because in 2013, the Victorian government, of course, enacted the Open Courts Act following criticism that there was a culture of suppression there. And then in 2017, Justice Vincent was asked to do a review because it was said that the suppression orders were still being made at a rate, I think it was 51.8% of all suppression orders in the country were made in Victoria. So the judge looked at it and he spoke to judges and it's in his report. One of the feedback that the judges gave to him was that they couldn't in effect trust the media or had a concern about the media reporting on cases in an inaccurate fashion. I don't think that can ever be a relevant factor. Okay, and just on that, Greg Craven, the Vice-Chancellor of the Australian Catholic University, has written a comment piece in the Australian newspaper today in which he says, quote, this is not a story about whether a jury got it right or wrong or about whether justice is seen to prevail. It's a story about whether a jury was ever given a fair chance to make a decision and whether our justice system can be heard above a media mob. So it goes to some of the things we've been discussing. But do you think that is what this story is about? Um I have a lot of respect for the professor, but with all due respect, I do not agree with that observation. Um, There can be no suggestion um, in my respectful view that such a assertion can be made in relation to the facts of this case. And I just think we need to be careful to respect the jurors who undertook a very difficult trial in relation to this matter and discharged their oath in accordance with what they are required to do on behalf of all of us in the community. And I think we need to be careful not to be making statements that in some way, um, in some way, um, the jurors were influenced by anything other than the facts in the case. 